Hi guys, welcome to Computerized Control. Today's lesson is about design with uncertainty. Consider the operational envelope of a nonlinear plant. We have, for instance, two variables like load and speed that affect mostly the variation of behavior from region to region of operation. We take a central point, let's call it A, and do linearization resulting in a transfer function. And you know, as we go apart from the point A, this linear model is less and less accurate. We take the plant's description at point A to develop the control design. We have the specifications for disturbance rejection, bandwidth and phase margin, and we develop a controller CA fulfilling all specifications. We close the loop, controller CA with the model FA, and we get the control system ready for testing. We test the controller at point A, and we have a response as specified. Just perfect. But now the question arises, what will happen to the control system when the plant moves to other regions of the operational envelope, always using the same controller CA? The controller is one, CA, but as we operate in different regions, the local behavior will admit different linearizations. So now, under different conditions, but using the same controller, it is possible to observe some degradation on the performance, or even having the control system resulting in stable. Ideally, we could identify different regions get the central point for each of them, and design appropriate controllers for each of local linearized model. Then, we would have a bank of controllers, and when changing the operational conditions, the corresponding controller would go in action. This control technique is well known and is designated as gain scheduling. Could this gain scheduling solve all our problems with uncertainty? It is best for plants with a wide range of operation. It's adequate for structure well-known linearities. Can be switched or continuously adapting. It's easy to implement in computerized control. But the switching between controllers is not trivial. It requires the design of multiple controllers. It is a nonlinear controller and do not cope with time variance and uncertainty. Cecina found tip. This is not a pipe, but the drawing of a pipe. In this famous painting, Marguerite highlights the difference between the real thing and its representations. A model is always a presentation of the real plant, not the real plant. Even when we have a good nonlinear model for all operational regions, we still have to deal with the uncertainty in the modeling process. Uncertainty is smaller at low frequencies, usually dominated by conservation laws. Usually, high frequency behavior is more difficult to model, for instance, turbulence effect, vibrational modes. When the units to be controlled are manufactured in a large number, tolerance and parameter dispersion causes uncertainty. Time variance due to the aging process are more severe to high frequency behavior, for instance, reduced bandwidth. And the marginal costs of obtaining a more accurate model are ever growing. So, how to deal with uncertainty in the design process? We start with our nominal model, 
the possible linearization at a specific operating point. And we model the uncertainty as a delta. This delta adds to the plant model, but we don't have exact description of it. We can do it in this additive way or in a multiplicative way. They are both equivalent, but the multiplicative makes more sense in the frequency domain framework, so we stick with this last one. It is common that after we develop a nominal plant model, when we validate using experimental data under different conditions, we get a picture like this. This is the uncertainty cloud of all possible plants our controller has to be capable of dealing with. Taking the contour of all possible cases, we define the function w depending on the frequency in this multiplicative manner. The full model with multiplicative uncertainty description goes like this, where delta is the unitary ball of uncertainty taking all possible directions, and W quantifies the magnitude of the uncertainty with the frequency. Thus, on top of the nominal model, we have an envelope of uncertainty of all possible cases. We talk about a robust control when our controller is able to keep stability and performance under uncertainty. With the open loop G equal to CF, we first verify nominal stability, and second, we verify the robust stability condition that verifies that there is no possibility of encircling the point minus one. Taking this robust stability condition, this is equivalent to the condition of the closed loop gain should be less than the universal function W. As we know that the uncertainty is larger at higher frequencies, and also the shape of the closed loop T goes as the open loop gain G, consequently, for achieving robust stability, we need to make G at high frequencies lower than the inverse of W. Thus, adding to all previous specification condition, we now have the additional robust stability condition. Let us see a complete design example. For that, I took the problem of power control of wind turbines. We start by introducing the plant. This is a schematic of a wind turbine. So, we have the nacelle and the tower, the rotor, and the wind that impulsionates the blades. This makes the low speed shaft rotate and through a gearbox and clutch to make the high speed shaft rotate that is connected with the generator. We have a speed sensor that provides a signal to a controller and we actuate on the blade pitch, changing the amount of wind power that goes within the turbine. Additionally, we have a brake system and some anemometer and wind vane to control the yaw drive so we can align with the wind direction. We determine the transfer function of the plant that is subject to the wind speed fluctuations disturbance. In the first approach, this case 1, we consider the nominal rigid shafts model. So, from the wind power to the rotation of the rotor and through the gearbox to the rotation of the generator. And we have the controlled variable, which is the electric frequency and the power delivered to the grid. All this by changing the control action, which is the blade pitch. We get the transfer function and we draw the frequency response. Nonetheless, we know that due to the magnitude of the momentum involved, some structural flexibility is to be expected. 
This is the mechanical connection between the rotor and the generator. It has a spring damper equivalent representing the shaft torsion. If we swipe the values of K and B parameters, spring and damper, we get a range of possible frequency responses for the plant, defining the uncertainty model. And that will be used for the robustability condition. Some considerations regarding the control of wind turbines. Wind turbines require control systems to ensure their structural integrity and stabilize the power output. The wind is a fluctuant power source, thus acting as a disturbance for the control system. By changing the blade's angle, the pitch, it is possible to modulate the amount of power that is transferred from the wind to the electric grid. Controlling the generator slip, or the electric frequency, is an indirect way of controlling the electric power output. This plot provides us some information regarding the expected spectrum for the wind disturbances that will be used to set the disturbance rejection bandwidth on 0.1 radians per second. Then we have to specify the desired behavior of our system. Closed loop specification. Bandwidth, let's take it 0 0.5 radians per second. Stability, we want that the overshoot be less than 10%. Sensitivity, we want an attenuation of 20 dBs in the range of 0 0.1 radians per second. And regarding robustness, we want that the complementary sensitivity be less than the inverse of W. So let's take the closed loop specification to the open loop indicators. So the bandwidth is about the gain crossing frequency, 0 0.5 radians per second. Stability with an overshoot be less than 10% is about the adequate phase margin of 60 degrees. And then, for the sensitivity, the attenuation requires that the open loop gain be higher than 20 dBs in the region of 0 0.1 radians per second. And for robustness, we want that the open loop gain be less than the inverse of W. And now the design process itself. So we start by selecting the Nyquist frequency by 10 times the maximum frequency, which derives in a 0 0.1 second for the sampling period. We discretize the plant using the sampling period and the ZOH method, and we will include one sample delay following the approach that we have been seeing in lab. And this is the result. So we have here the specification for the attenuation. So we should go above this line. We should cross the zero dBs at this point with the adequate phase margin. And the open loop gain should go below the inverse of W. But this is in the discrete time. So, step three, we apply the bilinear transformation from Z to the domain W, and we again plot the frequency response now in the new frequency and compare it against the specification. So this plot is almost the same, but now without the limitation of the Nyquist frequency. In step five, we find the current magnitude at the gain crossing frequency and use it to compute the gain necessary to elevate the previous line to a point where it crosses 0 dBs at 0 0.5 radians per second. This gain is 46.9 or 33.4 dBs. So the next step is about solving this aspect of the attenuation. So this line should go above 
the 20 dB is here. For that, we will use a lag compensator. A lag compensator is this structure that has a high gain at low frequency and 0 dB is at high frequency using this structure. So, as you can see, if you replace W by 0, the static gain is 1 over A, this quantity here at low frequency. And then we have this impact in the phase, which is not good, but should be tolerable. So now we have to find the values of A and T to solve our current problem. You can also see that the impact of selecting the adequate T depends on how much gain we can tolerate for different frequencies. So we design a light compensator to increase the low frequency gain above the attenuation. And this gives a gain of A1 and T1 depicted here. And now, as we plot the new frequency response, we can compare it against the specification. And we see that now, the open loop gain is above the attenuation and is also below the inverse W. The only problem being that we are not complying the phase margin. So the next step is to solve the phase margin by using the lead compensator. The lead compensator has a similar structure with the lag compensator. The, diff the main difference being that in this case, A is larger than one. And instead of 1 over A, when we have 1 divided by the square root of A, the impact of this is that we have 0 dB at this middle point. So now we have to find the values of A and T. And for that, the selection of A depends on the maximum phase that we want to add in this central point. And the parameter T depends on the frequency where we want to put the controller, the compensator. So for this specific case, A2 and T2 goes like this. And as we plot the picture, we see that now our phase margin is above the 60 degrees. It gets a little bit worse in this attenuation specification and is being compliant with the inverse of W. We can make a final adjustment of the K0 gain if needed, and the design process in W domain is complete. So we made a little adjustment, and now we are complying with all four elements. We applied the bilinear transformation and computer controller in the Z domain. Finally, we just need to implement and test the controller on the real plant. This is all for today. Thank you very much for watching. Please send me your feedback or press like below. Thank you. Bye-bye.